Eh, bon dia, buenos dies, good morning. We are in our second day of the meeting, and this is the plenary session on statistics. On this occasion, we have the great fortune to have the presence of Professor Kerry Mengersen. Professor Mengersen is an honor Australian statistician with a long research and professional career of great international prestige. <coughs> she holds a mathematical statistics and computing degree with honors and a PhD in mathematical statistics, both from the University of New England in Australia. She is currently a distinguished research professor in statistical science and the director of the CUT Center for Data Science in Brisbane. She is also associate member in the Department of Statistics at the University of Oxford. She was a deputy director in the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence in Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, and an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow, both from 2015 to 2021. She is Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, of the Academy of Social Science in Australia, and the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is elected fellow on the International Society for Bayesian Statistics, analysis, no statistics, of the Institute of Mathematical Science, of the Royal Society, and uh, she is uh, the past, a past uh, president of the International Society for Bayesian Statistics. Professor Mergensen research focuses on the utilization and development of new statistical and computational methods that can help to solve complex problems in the real world. This is very difficult. Problems in the fields of environment, genetics, health and medicine, and industry. Her research interests include complex system modeling, Bayesian statistical modeling, computational methods and applications, Bayesian networks, and applied statistics, among others. Her excellence in research is supported by more than 350 journal publications, over 50 invited international conference presentations, the attraction of more than 30 large research grants, and the supervision of more than 30 postgraduate students in the last five years. Professor Mengersen lecture will deal with a very important topic of today, which is sensitive data. These are data subject to privacy conditions, and she will explain some ways of working with them, in particular, federated learning and synthetic data generation. The scientific committee of this meeting is extremely grateful for the effort made by Professor Mergenser to participate in our meeting. Australia is very far. <laughs> and I would also like to add that although our society, society is improving a lot in terms of equality between women and men, we still have a long way to go. And having researchers like Professor Kerry Mengersen helps us to make the excellence of women in science more visible. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and, and it's long, isn't it? But, um, but thank you very much. 
It's a delight to be here and, um, and I'm really grateful for the invitation to speak and I'm honoured to be able to share some of the work that's done by the people in our research team at QUT in Australia. Um, it's also an, a great opportunity to return to Alicante um, and I'll explain a little later why that is. So I'd like to start first by saying that I am a Bayesian st statistician and, um, and we have a... Who here is Bayesian statistician? in Bayesian statistics. You have a couple? Great. Okay, so we have a long history of Bayesian statistics. In fact, way back in the beginning, even before my time, there was um, Thomas Bayes and Laplace that really started to promote the idea of um, probability theory and how we might um, understand the probability of an outcome given the, the data. Um, the big issues with this, of course, as this gained popularity, there were some criticisms. And so the criticisms were around the role of prior distributions and also the, the computational methods that could be used to actually implement some of these, uh, this new theory. And because of this then, there was a decline in the interest of Bayesian statistics and an increase in the interest of just looking at the likelihood, focusing just on the likelihood part of the, the Bayesian framework. And of course, that's the, uh, the, the work that was really promoted by Ronald Fisher. Um, we had Fisher and Neyman. Um, meanwhile, while this was really gaining in popularity, there was a lot of work being done in um, the development of prior distributions. And also, towards the 1980s, we really saw the change in the step change in the way that we could do computational analysis in Bayesian statistics with the advent of um, MCMC. And so we see Jeffries really playing a big role in, um, in prior distributions. And also uh, we see um, Gehman and Gehman and also Gelfand and Smith really starting to promote uh, the computational MCMC methods. That brings us now to today. And the world is, um, is in statistics is very strongly Bayesian um, oriented. And we have many Bayesian statisticians in Spain as, and in Australia and around the world. And we've seen at this meeting here also a number of presentations by Bayesian statisticians, and it's great to see that. So um, the, the, I think of Valencia as the place where I really started to um, learn about Bayesian statistics and become part of the Bayesian community. The Valencia meeting started in 1979 here, and Jose Bernardo was a real driver in, um, in that. So we see this, I think, of um, Valencia as the, the sort of the birthplace of, um, of Bayesian, modern Bayesian statistics. Um, and I'd also like to pay, pay tribute to um, Susie Bayari, who was a good friend and colleague um, and who uh, died before her time here. Um, this is just a, a, for people who are Bayesians here, a trip down memory lane. So this was the 1979 conference and the people, about 90 people that Jose Bernardo and others brought to Valencia to talk about Bayesian statistics. It was like this little group at that time, a small community, but a really powerful community. If you look through the names there, you will see the giants in our, in our field, and in fact, giants in statistics in general. And, um, and now, of course, we see Bayesian statistics really in, through the ISBA meetings, uh, the International Society of Bayesian Analysis, going from 90 people to 1,000 people and more throughout the world. And so we see even here in Valencia, we see the, the, this good work in Bayesian analysis being continued through, for example, the, the Bayesian summer schools. And these have been running, and I see some nods here from people who, who must be involved in that. Um, it's a great um, to, to see that. And in fact, on the other side of the world, we also have conferences and Bays on the Beach, uh, for example, which is running in February 2024. Um, this is where the little red dot is where Brisbane is. Uh, at QUT, this is where the conference will be. You're all invited if you would like to come to Australia um, in February next year for the Bayesian uh, conference. Bayesian statistics is an important now an important part of statistics, and statistics now is an important part of data science. And so at QUT, we have our statistical science group, but also a centre for data science in which we've brought together people from statistics mathematical sciences, information science, computer science, and computer engineering or e-research in this sort of um, large umbrella of data science. 
Also, through those core programs, we have then the, the domains, the applied domains in which data science and statistics and, uh, and data analysis is really important and good methods being developed in the applied areas. We also then have strong links with our industry partners that are starting to ask and um, have been continuing to ask, how do we use Bayesian statistics in practice? And so our core programs in the Centre for Data Science, as you see here, are around responsible data science, ethics, privacy, governance, around human-centred AI, data for discovery, new types of data that are available now, models and algorithms, and complex data analytics. And of course, the application in many different areas. In fact, one of the areas that I'll just point out here is in sports systems. So we're starting to develop a lot of um, interest in, in sports data science. And in fact, we have uh, 25 PhD scholarships available for people to work in data science. So if you know anybody, please come and have a chat to me. Um, the Centre for Data Science uh, goes across the university, and so you can see here the different areas that are interested in statistics, data science in general, and so we as statisticians have this broad reach across many different areas of, the, of, uh, of research across the university. And what we've tried to do in, at, um, in, in Australia is understand that we have these centres for data science that are developing, and I'm sure it's the same in Spain, that uh, we need to connect. And so we have about 30 different research centres that are connected through an Australian data science network. It's a very low key um, uh, network that uh, we're trying to promote communication, share opportunities, bring together people with different expertise and so on. So this is something that's been going for about three years now um, that we have, um, have developed. The work that I want to talk about today is work that I've undertaken with, um, with a number of people, and in fact, these people are the, the leaders in this work, so I get the pleasure of talking about their, their work. So we have Jessica, uh, Jess Cameron, who is really taking the, um, the mantle of a lot of work that's been done through the Cancer Council Queensland and uh, its collaboration with QUT. Uh, so she's at Cancer Council Queensland. And we have the um, Jamie Hogg, a PhD student who's been working on some modelling that I'll show you. The Australian Cancer Atlas, which is the, uh, the motivation for the work that I want to talk about in, um, in sensitive, the dealing with sensitive data. And then Connor Hassan, a PhD student, and Rob Salomon, who's a, um, a, a, a senior researcher who's just left QUT, actually. And uh, they've been working on, on federated learning and the synthetic ge data generation, which I'll talk about a little later. But I want to start with the, the Australian Cancer Atlas. And this is a product that we have developed over a number of years that aims to, it's underpinned by a Bayesian spatial model, which I'll show in a minute. But, um, but what it aims to do is to bring to life the, the, um, the, the posterior estimates of the Bayesian model um, across Australia. So this is a spatial model that provides estimates of incidence and relative survival at 2,000 small area levels um, across Australia. And uh, the idea is to be able to demonstrate this for about 20 cancers and to be able to provide information at that small area level. So you can zoom in, see your particular estimates of cancer, in cancers in your area, and also then be able to compare with different areas. Really trying to understand also and communicate the uncertainty around those estimates as well. As I said, this is underpinned by a Bayesian statistical model, a spatial model, um, and this spatial model is a very simple uh, spatial model, and we have um, others that we've seen in this conference and, and that people know about, but basically what we have is a number of cancer cases in a particular area. We have um, model this as a Poisson, distribution uh, um, and realizations from a Poisson distribution with an expected value with some, uh, some uh, fixed effects uh, and also then some um, residual. And we break that residual up into um, a component that we can explain through a spatial random effect and then just some uh, random unstructured noise. So the spatial random effect, in this case, we use a conditional autoregressive prior in the, uh, in the spirit of Julian Bisag's work, and uh, this is taking then the, the average, in effect, of the, the residuals or the spatial um, components from the neighbours. So trying to then build this sort of local spatial smoothing 
across the, uh, the area. Now, the nice thing about this is that um, it captures then the information in a particular region, but understanding two things. One is that that might be quite uh, small numbers, so it might be quite um, uh, not so robust, but also that we have to protect privacy around numbers. So if we have cancer numbers, then we, we need to then provide some sort of privacy. And this local smoothing then, borrowing from your neighbours, means that we increase the robustness and we also um, provide some of that privacy to the level where the, uh, the, the agencies are happy to share this modelled information. They won't share the counts, but they will share these, um, these modelled estimates. And that's, um, that's useful. Being able to do that means that we um, actually obtain a lot of inferences from this um, information. So we have the posterior distributions, which then give us estimates of the regression coefficients. We also get spatial, spatially smoothed estimates of the standardised incidence um, and relative survival for each area. We get the estimates of uncertainty associated with that. We get some understanding of the spatial variation. Is there spatial variation for these different cancers? And we also get these probabilistic comparisons between areas and also with, uh, uh, above particular thresholds, for example, above the national average. When we do this, uh, the first tranche of work that we did, it's sort of, so what? We, we demonstrate this, what do we get? What we were able to do was to show that there's a lot of spatial inequality. Where you live matters with respect to cancer incidence and survival. And so people in country areas and people in rural and remote areas are really finding there's differences between their incidence and survival compared with people who live in urban areas. And this is a really important um, feature uh, for treatment, um, policy and so on. And you can see here the differences between urban, regional and remote uh, incidence and um, standardised incidence rates for the different kinds of cancers. We can show also through the, the relative survival that there is a difference. And this is for, um, this is for colorectal cancer. And you can see here the different survival curves for localised and advanced cancer for people who live in major cities and people who live in very remote areas. And we see that there's a difference in the relative survival. Now, we're in a country, it's a we think of it as a developed country, um, where that sort of spatial variation shouldn't occur. And so we ask why, and we ask how do we, what would happen if we didn't have that spatial variation? How many lives could we save if we didn't have that kind of spatial discrepancy? And so um, we can calculate that, of course, and we can calculate that with some uncertainty. So we could save um, 470 lives uh, from um, colorectal cancer and 170 lives on average from um, breast cancer. And these, um, these inferences that we can make and these estimates based on our spatial models, our Bayesian spatial models, are a way of communicating to policymakers and to the public the importance of um, the, 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 the atlas and also of the, um, the importance of spatial disparities. And this then led to a lot of media coverage uh, in, in Australia around cancer risk and the spatial disparities and um, led then to policy change. And um, what, this is one example where we've seen statistical modelling really make a difference. So the policy change was to increase the rebate for people in rural areas to access treatment. And so we see that kind of you know, direct um, relationship between our modelling and at the policy, and so um, I'm, I'm proud of that work. We're looking to extend the Cancer Atlas now to add spatial and spatial temporal components to the model, and that will be released at the end of this year, early next year. Also looking to add risk factors um, for, to the model, and, um, and also looking to geotag people's stories. We know the what, we know the where, but we don't know the why. And so what we're doing then is asking, going to ask people um, about their treatment experience and about the potential reasons for their cancers. Imagine if we can geotag those stories to the atlas and then we can use natural language processing, which we know how to do, to extract the concepts from those stories and to be able to add that then to the, um, to the data. So that's the imagine that will come in the next, next tranche of work. The other thing that we would like to do is to make this so that it's more dynamic and so we can update this in a regular fashion. 
and I'll talk about those two things. Firstly, I want to talk about updating the, um, adding the risk factors. Now, the, the issue with adding risk factors is that a lot of the information about the risk factors that we care about come from surveys. We don't have this at a whole of Australia level. So we, um, we have small samples and we, um, we have this in particular um, places. So we need to come up with um, models that are going to allow us to combine this survey information with this, the, um, the broad scale information we have for the cancer cases. And so we have individual level models which have their, their, um, their benefits but challenges. And we also have area level models which have their benefits and challenges that you can see here. So what we wanted to do, and this is work that's been led by Jamie Hogg, is to, um, to develop a two-stage approach. So in the first stage then, we have this um, individual level model where we're going to have a pseudo likelihood uh, logistic mixed model, um, and we get the estimates from that, and then we add it to the broad scale area model um, through a logistic normal model and uh, we get our final estimates for each of the areas. So just very briefly, I'll just show you the, um, the individual level model, which is a, um, the individual, uh, whether you have the risk factor or whether you don't, at an individual level for the surveys, comes from a Bernoulli distribution. We can model a Bernoulli through a logistic regression, as we would normally do. And this um, then involves these individual level um, estimates that we get. We get those as uh, posterior estimates with their sampling variances, and we can transform those through a, through a um, logit transformation. We can then take those estimates and we can add them into our area level model. So here we're going to be able to get estimates for um, the, the areas that we haven't seen. Um, so we get a posterior distribution then with the appropriate uncertainty as to whether we've seen the um, we've seen information in that area or whether we have inferred in, um, for areas that we haven't seen for all of the areas for Australia. When we look at the, how that works in Australia, this is an example of five risk factors that are important for our cancer um, atlas, and you can see here the the, the where these um, surveys have been undertaken. So there's a lot of Australia that is not covered by these risk factors. But in fact, there's a lot of Australia that's not covered by many people either. So we have to take that into account. People live around the, 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 the boundaries of Australia. Uh, so the model looks at, as I said, we have a, a stage one um, approach and also a stage two approach that will then allow us to estimate across the whole of Australia. Um, and so uh, I'm happy to go into more detail about that if people are interested. What we get from that then are posterior estimates for these risk factors. And so um, Jamie's been working on um, posterior medians for the, the risk factors of interest here. And, um, and we also then can map those. So we can estimate the, um, the proportions, for example, risky alcohol consumption. You can see here. Um, different areas of Australia, the chloropleth map shows that um, the darker the colour is going to be the, the higher the risk um, associated with cancer. Um, and then also for we get an associated uncertainty with that. We still have the issue, and I'd be happy if people are talking about this here, um, of how to communicate and use estimates of uncertainty and how, and how we get policymakers to use uncertainty. Um, but we can talk about, for example, the probability of exceeding the national average. And in fact, some of this work, um, when I was talking to a colleague and they looked at the Australian Atlas, they were in, um, in Perth, uh, in the other side of Australia, in Western Australia, and uh, they said they looked at the Australian Atlas and they saw the, um, the risks for um, melanoma. And in fact, in Perth, there was a big red blob um, over the area that they lived, and so they made an appointment with their dermatologist. That's what we want. So we see that this um, atlas is really useful. Now, one of the, the issues, um, the second issue, is about dynamic updates. If we want to update the atlas um, regularly, then we need to be able to get the information to do this. Now, we have cancer data that is coming from the different states of Australia, and each state contains its own, maintains its own register. Australia is this federated system of different states. Each state has its own health system and its own register for cancer. 
When we want to be able to create something like a national cancer atlas, we have to get permission from each of those states to bring together the data. And that takes time, effort, and permissions. If we want information about individuals for, for, uh, for the risk factors, we have to then obtain this private data from surveys. And that also is, a, is problematic, and especially in, um, in, in, uh, because it is distributed. So we have this issue of data in silos and the issue of data privacy. So we have a real issue of governance uh, that's, uh, that affects what we do. And what we want to think about is how can we do something different? And this is not only in the context of the Australian Cancer Atlas, but it's in the context of very many types of data that we have where it's very difficult to bring together the data that we need for our analyses. As our analyses become more complex, as the questions that we ask become more involved, as we start to think about systems rather than individual questions, then we need to be collating different sources of data. And when we do that, then we do often run into this issue of not being able to bring together those data into the one big database that rules them all. We're not going to be able to do that. So, we need to think about how else what might we do this. This is not only in the, um, in the context of health, it can also be in the context of um, business, so commercially sensitive data that we can't bring together. Um, and so there's many different cases where this um, may not happen. So the, what we've been looking at are alternatives. And one of the alternatives that's very attractive at the moment and has gained a lot of interest in, um, in the computer science world emerging interest in the statistics world, but certainly a lot of interest in the, um, the, the practicing world is in federated learning. Now, there's a lot of literature on this, but not so many cases of it actually working in practice. Does anybody here work on the area of federated learning? Yeah? Oh, okay. I was going to go, there's a person to, to, um, for an expert. Uh, okay, so the area of uh, federated learning, where we do the analysis, we leave the data where they are, and we do the analysis in the cloud. So I'm going to talk about that. So the data stay with their data custodians, and, um, and we don't access, we don't see the data, and nobody else sees anybody else's data, so you can hang on to your own data, but then we, we do the analysis in the cloud. If we can get this working, I think that this is a revolution in the way that we do statistics. And it's not just an algorithmic problem. It's not just a problem of how do we do that sort of, you know, that, calcul that sort of transfer, in, um, but it's actually a modeling question. If we can think about this federated learning system, then does that change the way that we think about modeling and the way that we might even write our models? in order to be able to capitalise on this new way of doing um, data analysis. The second way that um, we've been thinking about uh, addressing this, these challenges is through synthetic data generation. If we can generate data that look like the private data, but aren't the private data, then perhaps we can share that. And perhaps those data can have the characteristics that we care about in the real data that will allow us to develop um, the, the models and the tools that we need to develop some of the inferences, understanding that it's not the real data, to be able to share it and aggregate it and so on. So these are the kinds of things that we could do with synthetic data if we can do it for the kinds of data that we need um, in, in our usual statistical modeling approach. So let me talk firstly about the federated learning approach. So this is, as I said, the analysis of the data without the data leaving the source. And if we can do this, then you can see that there's a range of benefits that are going to be available from, uh, that, that are going to ensue from that. We don't, we avoid a lot of the ethical, political, legal issues. We, um, we can leave the data where they are, so that increases the control over the data from the data custodians, and the potential to improve data quality, and timeliness, because we don't have to go through these long permission processes, and um, the data custodians are looking after their data and updating it, and also we, but we also um, can increase the inferential capability by bringing the, um, the analysis together, bringing these data together in a sort of virtual way. So the overview here is where we have the individual data custodians with their data, and, um, and then we 
we do the analysis in the cloud and there's going to be a communication between the, the, um, where the, the analysis is being done and where the, the data are being kept. So back to the Australian Cancer Atlas, and really this was about five years, five or six years ago that, um, that I went to visit uh, the, the Dutch Cancer Reg um, Agency, IKNL, and uh, they were starting to think about federated learning and had built a, um, a, an open source platform called um, Vantage 6, and this was for federated learning. So they've come a long way since then, but these were the early days of it. And they were using this in the context of, um, or extending it to Eurocare. And so looking at um, being able to combine information across countries. And um, the collaborations that they were looking at, and, um, and I have no, no understanding why these collaborations happened, but it was between the Netherlands and Taiwan, for example, um, sharing data. Now there's no way that they were going to share their, their, their full data sets um, across countries, but could they share the the, um, the, the data in a way that means they could do that, some analysis that could tell them about rare cancers, that could tell them more about different, um, uh, the, the cancers in different social contexts and cultural contexts. And these were really important insights that they gained from this. The Netherlands and Italy, and also the Dutch Cancer Agency and the National Registry. So different ways that they were looking at being able to, to use this federated learning approach to overcome some of the usual barriers that they were seeing in being able to undertake these more um, detailed analyses and comprehensive analyses. So the way that this works then is that you have the data in each of the different um, uh, repositories or nodes. If we think about a, um, a, a sort of typical regression um, model that we might want, what we want is not necessarily the data, but we want the components of the model that, um, that we can then combine. So in this case, we want the X prime X, um, uh, X prime W X terms. We can take those from each of the nodes and the X prime um, W Z terms, and then we can bring those together in a generalized linear model to form our terms that we need. And from that then, we can create the, um, the estimates that we want. So this is Vantage 6. Um, and what you see then is that in the original approach, what you would do is that you would ask them for all the data from the data custodians to be gathered together and put into one place, and then the estimation and the analysis happen. In the federated approach, what you see is the data stay where they are, and, um, and then the analysis is actually done in the cloud and, um, or in a, in a sort of virtual um, setting. And if you have very, very good eyesight, you would see that those numbers are the same, very similar. So one question that comes of this, and this, is, um, this was really inspiring for us to see uh, as, a feder as a working federated learning approach. But one of the things we're asking is, the current focus is on horizontally partitioned data. So that means that every node has the same Xs and Ys, and what it is like is like having a subset of the data in each of the, the, the nodes. What happens, though, is if we want to have vertical partition data, we want to analyze data where, for example, one node will hold um, x1, another node will hold x2, another node will hold y, and so on, and we want to do that. That's a harder question, actually, and it's a, still an, a fairly open question about how to do good vertical um, federated learning. The second question is that there's only limited um, types of models that are possible at present. So most of the, um, the, or the analysis to date is really around GLMs, Gaussian processes, neural networks, where we only have, we, we're interested in an overall estimate of the parameters um, from each of, um, um, based on the information from each of these nodes. So none of these models naturally have silo-specific variables. So if we think of a sort of mixed models, or we think of something where we have local uh, models, um, local parameters that we're interested in, and also global parameters. So we were interested in, can we fit generic structured probabilistic models in this federated learning setting? So instead of just having um, an X and a Y that we bring together to give us some overall estimates, what we want is to have an X and a Y, the X and Y that we bring together, and we have silo-specific estimates and also um, a global estimates. So we think of these hierarchical models that we might set up. 
The third open question is, can we accommodate heterogeneous data uh, so, um, and also have partial silo participation? In other words, do we need all of the silos to give us all of the information, um, which might then um, delay the, um, the computation? And it might also, um, you know, some of the silos might not have some of the information. So the question then is, this is a heterogeneous um, data question, and this is still an open challenge. Um, we can think about this in some ways through our modeling by fitting some sort of you know, um, hierarchical model uh, that matches the sort of underlying structure that we see. And so we're working on that as well. So if we think about Bayesian inference then, we want to find this posterior distribution for theta, given y, based on our likelihood and our priors. And MCMC targets often, um, MCMC schemes, our Markov chain Monte Carlo schemes, uh, the typical workhorse of Bayesian analysis, often target um, the log um, of the, the posterior here. And, um, and a popular alternative is variational inference. Now, there was a talk yesterday on variational inference, which was great. And, um, and what we see is that this is more scalable. Um, fewer likelihood evaluations are required from the variational approach. And so um, if we assume a parametric form then, also we have this, um, this distributed algorithms that can be developed much more easily because it's easier to deal with a parametric function when we have this distributed setup than if we're thinking about um, sort of some non-parametric or, or alternative function because we have a, a, um, we're going to think of a parametric function rather than having to have this empirical draws from a distribution. So variational inference in a nutshell is given here. This is work of Connor Hassan and, um, and uh, 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 supervised and supported by uh, Rob Salomon. So variational inference in a nutshell is that we choose some parametric approximation um, to the distribution of interest. And we can think about this uh, and rationalize it in terms of regardless of what our posterior distribution looks like, if we're actually interested in an estimate of the mode, then around that mode is going to be fairly Gaussian. Okay, we miss some of the, the information in the tails of the distribution, um, and sometimes that leads to, for example, smaller estimates of variance um, for our estimates. But what we see is that around the mode, typically, regardless of the distribution, is relatively Gaussian. So what we can do then is we can take this parametric approximation um, uh, around our mode, and then we can update the, um, the variational parameters using gradient descent. And so we have the objective function then is going to be the lower bound of the evidence here. And we just keep taking these, um, these iterations along the gradient to the mode here. Uh, so what we wanted to do then was to look at two approaches in this, how do we take this variational inference approach and use it in this federated learning setting? So the first conditionally structured variational inference approach was to say we have, um, a, a, we assume that the global latent variables here are estimated by a data from more than one silo and we have local latent variables that are going to be estimated via the data just from that silo. So we have these local estimates and these global estimates here. And a structured variational approximation then can be developed of the form that you can see here, which is going to be a product then of our global um, variables and also the, um, the local variables from each of the nodes here. And the choice of the variational approximation then is, can be judicious. Um, but we can look at the sets of variational parameters for the local latent variables can incorporate this dependence on the global variables. So it's going to be Z for our local variables given our global variables and our global variables given our local variables. And you can see how that we have that kind of dependence that's um, going to be structured. And that's where we need this kind of um, communication between the, um, the, the, the cloud where the analysis is being undertaken and the individual nodes, because we need to pass this information about the, each of the nodes develops the local estimates, given the global estimate, passes it up to the top, update the global estimate, pass it back to the local estimates, and so we go on until we get some sort of stability. 
So the question then is, can we fit this generic structured probabilistic model in the federated learning system? So we want these local estimates and these global estimates. And um, we want to do this sort of structured, federated, variational inference um, to get there. So um, what we're going to do then is to, as I said, this is just to, sort of repeating what I've been saying, is that we're going to um, have the gradient information um, with respect to our global latent variables communicated to the server in the first instance at each iteration. And then we're going to return the variational approximation um, to the, um, to the uh, server and then get the update of the global latent variable and then that gets passed down, back down again. And so the models that are included in this kind of class are quite large. We can think of hierarchical models. We can also think of topic models. Um, we can think of hierarchical variational autoencoders and so on. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of models that can then fit under this framework. So now we have extended from the sort of the, the GLMs and neural nets that we start with uh, that are available now to a much broader class of models here. One of the issues with this algorithm, though, is that we need this communication at each iteration. And so that then is time consuming. And so what we've also looked at is, can we do something that's going to communicate back to the nodes, update in the nodes, and then pass back? So not have so many communications going. And so this is then the federated average um, approach. So we have this FedAV analog here. So we don't have this iteration, uh, this information being passed at each iteration, but we're going to have multiple gradient descent steps at the nodes. And so when we think about doing this, um, what we've done so far is to restrict ourselves to a Gaussian distribution, and we might need to, um, to uh, expand that. We'd like to expand it in the future, but take multiple steps in each silo and then to communicate back um, after that. Now, this, the server then will calculate the Wasserstein Barrier Center um, of the Gaussians, uh, and then it will pass that back. So this is a way that we might be able to do this sort of much more efficient communication um, for this federated learning. Just as a, an example for those who are interested, here's the algorithm. Happy to share this afterwards. It's also in the, um, the paper that's on archive. Now, we can go from Bayesian GLMs to Bayesian neural nets. Um, we can think of a single output uh, generalized linear model as being a version of a, um, a single output feed forward neural network. And we can think about this then leading into the deep um, neural networks, um, deep learning approaches that, um, that we know as well. So we have this single output feed forward um, neural network through to the deep neural network. And um, so we go from our, our linear models through to our generalized linear models through, or general linear models through to our mixed models and then through to our um, neural networks through to our deep neural networks. Um, and if we think about this then, we can, we can try to address the third challenge that I talked about with respect to this heterogeneous data. And so we're just starting this work um, where we're starting to allow um, use um, our Bayesian neural networks um, in this context. So we allow hierarchical pooling um, of the layers in this federated system. So as it's almost like the model transfer work that, or transfer learning work that um, is in uh, the, the, um, the uh, neural network literature. So we think of having the, the, the layers, the deeper layers of the neural network stay the same but what we're going to do then is just to modify the, um, the top layers of the neural network. So we're going to allow hierarchical pooling in these top layers of the neural network. So we're going to have the different weights in a, in a neural network uh, for the particular silos, and we're going to model those weights hierarchically um, in the, across the silos. So I won't go into too much detail about this, but if people are interested, then I'm very happy to, um, to talk more about it. So that means then that we can share these neural network weights um, across the silos, allowing for the information in the silos, when we can capture this sort of heterogeneity in the, the, um, the different silos as well. 
And this allows us then to go to much more complex um, hierarchical models um, than we have been able to, to use before. Right, so coming back then to the Cancer Atlas, and we say, great, you know, we've got all of these new results, we've got these new methods and so on. How does this apply in our Cancer Atlas? There's a challenge. And the challenge is that in the Cancer Atlas, we have this, um, it's talked about this uh, dependence structure on your neighbours. So imagine now that I am, um, I am a state of Australia and I have areas that border another state. And so when I'm on those boundaries, I actually need, if I'm going to do this spatial smoothing, I need to know about the information in the other state. And I don't have that. And so I have this dependence structure that I've built up um, that uh, then requires me to have some information from my neighbour. Okay. Now, the thing is that we can do some sort of, you know, nicely structured dependence. Um, we, we can figure that out. But when we have the, um, the dependence structures that we can't do is when we have some of the, the, the neighbours actually in the other node. And so that actually creates a question because we, we can't share that actual information. So we're still working on this. We have some ideas about layering and so on, but um, it's a, still an open question. How am I going for time? Are you comfortable listening for a bit longer? Ten minutes, perfect. All right. I want to um, come now to the, the second way that we've been thinking about this. So that's where we're up to with the, the federated learning approach. And as I said, I think that um, you know, we've come some way, but really, you know, like federated learning and the types of modelling that we need to do is as long as this, uh, this stage here and we've come from here, we've sort of got to about here and there's a long way to go. So I'm very happy for, for anybody who's working in this area to, um, to collaborate. Um, what do we want to do in the, the second way of thinking about this is to create this synthetic data. And as I said, what we want to do then is to use this because we can make closed data open. And again, this is work that um, Connor and Rob have been um, leading. And again, we can avoid a lot of the ethical and legal issues on sharing real data if we can share this kind of data. And I talked about the sports work that we're doing. And there's a lot of interest at the moment in, um, in um, sports privacy, privacy and um, ownership of data amongst athletes. Who owns the data for athletes? Should they own their own data? We work with indigenous groups in Australia and um, the question is, you know, do they, do they own their own data? How do we feel, like how do we share these kinds of data um, and think about privacy? So, one question then is, can we, um, can we generate this synthetic data? And um, that would then give us access to representative data that we can use to build models. Um, we can uh, have controlled replication or controlled generation of replicate data sets, which will be really beneficial for model validation and model development. And we can also open source the data for wider applications. Now, the question is that we want to be able to generate synthetic data or proxy data that captures the properties. In this case, we're interested in tabular data. So it captures the properties of tabular data typically arising from an observational study. So what's the problem? Well, synthetic data via deep generative models has been emerging over the last decade. And um, this, tip this has typically been used for image generation. So there's a lot of work on taking an image and making synthetic images of it, fake images of it. Um, there's no coherent framework, surprisingly, for the use of deep generative models for tabular data sets. And so we need to think about things like the choice of data normalization how variable types are represented um, in this kind of synthetic setup. Different classes of deep generative models that would be most beneficial for tabular data. Uncertainties about which properties of the deep generative models that gives the most desirable statistical properties that we care about um, in our analysis for different variable types. 
making sure that we keep the relationship between the different variables um, and also maintaining privacy and also being able to do model evaluation for this um, type of data. So it's quite an extensive list of challenges when we think about something that should be relatively easy for, um, for synthetic data generation. Now, I'm just putting this slide up because we get asked, why don't we just randomise each of the variables? Well, as statisticians, we know why we can't do that because we just break all of the, the, um, the, the relationships between the variables um, and so you know, we, we don't maintain the kinds of uh, in, in, uh, intricacies and relationships that we care about. So when we think about alternative solutions, what we want then is um, some requirements. We want generative, generating model that's going to be flexible and to capture these complex characteristics um, within the observed data set, and we also require privacy. So the approach that we've been looking at, and uh, this is Connor and, and Rob's work, as I said, is in privacy preserving deep generative models. So these are going to be probabilistic models that use neural networks to increase the expressivity of the, um, the relationships. So the deep here is in terms of the neural network. The probabilistic is because we want to induce some randomness. The generative is because we're going to simulate or generate um, these synthetic data um, samples. And also privacy preserving because we, um, we want to um, include privacy guarantees for the data. And um, I've got some slides at the end which we may not get to about differential privacy. I saw there was a talk about that yesterday that I, that I, um, that I heard, which was great. And uh, there's a lot of work in, who here works on differential privacy? This person here who talked about that yesterday? Yes. So we have again this single output um, GLM going to a single output feed forward neural network, going to a multi output GLM, going to a multi output feed forward neural network. And so we've got these different types of generative models that we can think about. We can have deep latent variable models, um, we can have normalizing flows, and we also have generative um, adversarial networks. So these are different ways that we can think about generating this kind of synthetic data. So we have deep latent variable models where we have input the latent variables into a neural network and the output parameterizes the likelihood of the data given the latent variables. Our normalizing flows are going to have input the latent variables, we're going to have a change of variable transform at that point, and then we're going to parameterize that change of variable by a neural network and then we're going to generate data from that um, neural network here, that estimated data distribution. Our generative adversarial networks is going to input the latent variables to an, a neural network. And within that framework then, we think about two neural networks. We have one neural network that is going to try to describe the features of our data. Okay. And then we have another neural network, the adversarial network, that comes in and tries to learn the differences between the, the data that we've generated and the real data. And if it can find those differences, it feeds that back to the first neural network. The first neural network generates better synthetic data. And then the adversarial network comes in again and goes, mm, can I find some differences here? I'm anthropomorphizing our neural networks. But, um, but we have the neural networks then saying, you know, can I find a difference, feeds that back until we get something that's similar enough and, to, and keeps the characteristics that we care about, but is not the real data. So that's the, um, the adversarial approach. So again, we have a deep latent variable model. Um, so examples of this are mixture models, factor analysis, um, deep latent Gaussian models, deep exponential families, sigmoid belief families, and so on. So we have our observed data going into a latent space and then producing our, our output. We have a normalizing flow which goes through a series of transformations. And so as you can see then there's a whole bunch of different types of, um, of uh, approaches that we can use for this as well. And finally our generative adversarial networks which I jumped to and talked about earlier. So we have this adversarial learning where we have this auxiliary network that tries to set up this game with the other neural network here um, to provide the information. So um, just to show some, we have a, a normalizing flow. Uh, if we have the iris data and uh, we want to, um, to estimate just using an MLE, 
then we would um, put that what we see is that this puts mass, if we're using an MLE, then this would put mass where the samples are. If we use a generative um, a, a, a adversarial network, then it's going to put mass on the sort of the realistic outcomes, uh, realistic looking outcomes here. So we get something that's a little bit different and um, potentially better from our, our GAN model than we do from our general MLE. Um, I'm going to go back to then the question of, um, of generating tabular data. And so each of the types of generative models actually struggles in different ways with tabular data. So even though we have come a long way with the development of these kinds of models and methods for generating synthetic data, there's still some challenges, some surprising challenges with respect to generating tabular data. And so you can see some of them here. Um, so we're looking at, um, at different emerging algorithms for generating tabular data. Now this is literature um, just in the last few years that's been developed um, and it's a really rich area of, uh, of, of work and research. So I'm, I'm interested in working in this space and seeing how we might use some of these new techniques for our work in, um, in the Cancer Atlas. So where to from here? Most of the current algorithms are GANs. GANs have these sort of unstable properties for what we want. Um, Non-GAN models are less amenable to, um, to modeling multiple data types. And we have um, generative models with stable training and good statistical properties across multiple variable types is what we want, but we don't have yet. And we're also interested in model evaluation. And this is difficult because we're not seeing the real data. Okay? We, we're just working with the synthetic data. And so we have to be able to evaluate these two data sets here. And we just really don't have good guidelines for how to do that at the moment and how to evaluate our models. So there's a lot of open questions here as well. Now, I'm not going to have time to talk about privacy, so please excuse me while I just flip through this, but understand that it's a big issue, um, differential, differential privacy. But I'm also going to caveat that by saying that differential privacy is one type of privacy and um, uh, a way of thinking about privacy. And it may not be the way that we actually want to, to have for the types of problems that we have as well. So there's some interest in other types of um, privacy measures that we can use in, in the, this context. Um, so as I said, we're interested in um, privacy. So ending at the beginning then, we're interested in synthetic data generation for the Australian Cancer Atlas. We're interested in federated learning approaches for synthetic, uh, for, for our Cancer Atlas. And by doing so then, we can really move the dial from where we are now in the Cancer Atlas, which I think is, um, is, a, is a very good product, to something in the future that can be even better. And that requires good statistics, good Bayesian statistics, and good data science. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, nice um, deep talk. Uh, I, I have only, only two questions. In, 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 in the case of the Atlas of Cancer, uh, I have seen some uh, similarities to works that have done people from Wollongong University working on a smaller estimation like Ray Chambers. Maybe the difference or the main difference is that, that in, in, in their case, the, the, the data can comes from a sample that is extracted at, at random from, from the population with sampling design. And, and, and I have seen that uh, in that context, they, they, they use simultaneous, instead of conditional uh, autoregressive, uh, they, they use the, the simultaneous autoregressive uh, random effects. And, and a second point concerning synthetic data, what I have seen is that uh, some people generate, for example, uh, census, census data, synthetic census data, but not, in, in, in not to learn about, uh, let's say, cancer or, or environmental uh, property, but to learn about uh, a statistical met methodology that uh, you want to, to, to check. 
I don't know, but maybe uh, what you want to do is, is something more uh, ambitious than that. I don't know. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So they're, they're two very good points. And so Ray Chambers is, um, is a giant in, in the world of official statistics in Australia um, and works in, uh, from Wollongong University. He works a lot with the Australian Bureau of Statistics and um, I'm on the uh, methodology com advisory committee with him. He, um, uh, so a lot of the work that's done, again, it's in spatial statistics and there's also Noel Cressy at, uh, at Wollongong as well that does a lot of work uh, in different kinds of um, spatial statistics. Um, and again, it's variations on the theme here. So part of what we need to do thinking about these random effect terms is uh, you know, what's best in terms of the type of data we've got and the type of configuration that we have. Um, so, um, so yes, we've been talking a lot with the, the, the different group, the different experts around the types of models that we use. The second question about synthetic data generation um, and for learning about methodology. Absolutely, and part of what we need to think about when we generate the data is keeping the characteristics that we care about in the data. And so some of that can be around characteristics related to an applied problem, can also be characteristics related to the, the data structure that we want to be able to preserve for the purpose of modeling. And I think that this is a good um, thing to keep in mind that uh, the, the data that we see as our generated data um, has been hopefully built with some intent. And so it may not actually be useful for other purposes. And so we need to be very careful about like, what's the provenance of that, um, that synthetic data? Um, why was it generated? In, for what purpose was it generated? Will it contain the types of uh, characteristics that we care about uh, for the type of modeling that we actually want to do? Yeah. Thank you. The idea is that you have, so you have the same data exactly in each country or it there's anything that can change from country to country and then can you consider in those federated data that changes between the way that data has been collected and also that maybe because you are supposing that all the parameters are the same and they have the same meaning in all across countries so yeah. there is something there that can be done? Uh, absolutely if you've really uh, you've really identified a really important point in this federated approach I think it's the same if we collect data generally, you know, for, for purposes, um, even if we're not in the federated setting, we really need to know the, the, the provenance of those data and also the, uh, the, the definitions and the characteristics and so on. And that becomes even more so when we're going across countries. So even if we say uh, taking we, what we think are the same variables in different, um, in different nodes, are they really the same variables? Have they been collected in the same way? They're the questions that statisticians ask, and they're the things that we can add to the model to try to make um, sure that we are, um, you know, when we, when we get an estimate from this federated setting, we believe it, uh, or that, that it actually means something. So I think that's where it's really important for statisticians to be involved in this federated learning uh, of research. Thank you. Thank you. All right.